Hey, welcome to You Have My Sword. Today, we are talking about the uncut gems version of Middle Earth and why shiny shit makes people insane. Cast Adam Sandler as Thingle, you cowards. Let's talk about it. So before we jump into it, let's answer yet another listener question really quick. So Dave writes, do you know what Tolkien's inspiration was for writing The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings? Hey, yes. So great question. And we do have a good amount of insight on what drove Tolkien to create these works. It's always interesting to think about and try to understand why any writer takes on such enormous undertakings, right? Uh, <laughs> writers are just built different. Early on in Tolkien's life, he had both an interest in languages and mythology. And around 1910, 1911, he invented Quenya, which was influenced by the Finnish language, which is obviously one of the elven languages um, in his universe. Then he came up with Sindarin in 1915 before he was sent to fight in the First World War, which very clearly put a pause on his projects. He also was very driven in his early career to create a mythology for England, which is what initially drove him to write or um, to at least write fantasy. Uh, he ended up writing The Hobbit for his kids initially, but his friends actually loved it so much they encouraged him to publish it. Um, so within The Hobbit, there are elements that link back to the Silmarillion, um, which kind of allowed him the freedom to expand this world. So the way he set up The Hobbit, um, you know, left it pretty open for him to expand the world. So now we know The Hobbit was a huge success, and um, he was actually asked for a sequel after he published it. He had uh, no clear ideas, but eventually decided that Bilbo's ring should be the link between the stories. Um, this then generated the third age, or rather, uh, its ending, I guess. <laughs> he also incorporated a dream about a destructive wave into his own version of the Atlantis myth, which was the drowning of Numenor by Iluvatar in the first age. So that's really cool to kind of think about. Um, he wrote a story called The Fall of Gondolin, which was the beginning of what becomes the Silmarillion, right? This utilized the two languages as the languages of the elves and gave them a history. Um, and it's said to be strongly influenced by his wartime experience, although Tolkien has said that nothing he wrote was innately inspired by war or religion rather a place to escape that. That's not to say he was not inspired by religion. He was, you know, just as he was inspired by the Norse poetic Edda, Arthurian stories he read as a child, uh, mythology, and um, many other Celtic sources inspired him as well. But a lot of people say like, oh, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings is an allegory for religion or for his wartime experience. And he has said, no, that is not the case. He found um, he found that that idea to be very boring. So um, a fun fact here is Tolkien was actually close friends with C.S. Lewis, and Lewis would proofread um, the evolution of the Silmarillion as Tolkien was writing it. So Lewis often told Tolkien it was all just a little too vague, uh, too broad to be published, and like begged Tolkien to produce a proper story. Tolkien was like, all right, bet my guy, and got to work on The Lord of the Rings by expanding the Silmarillion so everything kind of complemented each other. So he kind of went back and forth between The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion, kind of piecemealing um, this world together, right? Um, also worth mentioning, Tolkien was incredibly inspired by the landscape of Switzerland and his beautiful wife, Edith. So yeah, like most creatives, it starts as a seed and evolves tremendously over time. So that's how um, we came to understand Tolkien's um, inspiration for all of his, his works. So I hope that answers your question. I swear to God, when I talk, I just black out. So I hope any of that made sense. Anyways, now we're going to talk about the Silmarils. This is going to be fun. So 
We are talking about the thrice enchanted globes of light that shine until the final night, the Silmarils, the source of a bussy full of contention across the ages. I've been mentioning them throughout many of the episodes, especially in season two, so it makes sense to shed some light, no pun intended, on why these goofy orbs got everyone on Arda fucked up. The Silmarils were three gems of immense might and beauty. Their theft by Morgoth is the triggering fact um, of the events of the First Age. So, what were these little fuckers made of? The gems were crafted of a hard crystalline substance called um, Silima, which Feanor had devised as their shell and thus obviously were named after it. In their heart burn some of the light of Valinor from the two trees. Their exact nature and manner of making the Silmarils were known only to Feanor, and none other succeeded in making gems of comparable greatness and beauty. So Varda hollowed the Silmarils so that no mortal or evil hands were allowed to touch them without being burned immensely. But the Silmarils were tainted by arrogance and lust by anyone who desired them starting with Morgoth and then Feanor. So, as the oath of Feanor proclaimed, it resulted in evil ends such as the fall of the Noldor, the doom of Mandos, kin slayings, and the destruction of Doriath. Hey, we talked about nearly all of this in the last episode. Does your brain feel full of cool dumb shit yet or what? <laughs> The Silmarils were created by Feanor in Valinor after the unchaining of Melkor. That's when Melkor got off probation, right? So, according to a legend, Feanor conceived the idea of capturing the light of the trees from the hair of Galadriel, which shone with gold and silver. Galadriel's hair is often coveted throughout the stories um, and over her lifetime for being beautiful in a way that was unexplainable. Uh, hence why our boy Gimli asked her for simply one strand of it, and she returned his request with not one, but three. I cry every time. So, Feanor wore the jewels at festivals and the Eldar admired them, right? Melkor coveted their light and soon, as we know, corrupted by his lies, Feanor started to lock them away and became greedy for them. So, keeping with the ever-prevalent theme of greed and corruption in Tolkien's work, right? <laughs> After Feanor was um, exiled to Formanos, the Silmarils were stored in a chamber of iron. Together with Ungoliant, Melkor destroyed the two trees. The Silmarils now contained all that remained of the light of the trees. So that alone makes them incredibly important, incredibly rare. So because of that, the Valar begged Feanor to give up the Silmaril so they could restore the trees, but he refused. If you haven't listened to the episode before this, I implore you as it gives tons of context to exactly this. So, okay, so I kind of want to go into more detail about how Melkor stole the Silmarils because I think it's really fun. Also, you will hear me say Melkor and Morgoth, they are the same person. Um, so just try, try to keep up. My brain like switches between Melkor and Morgoth, but just know it is a name for the same person. So Melkor had killed Feanor's father, Finwë, the king of the Noldor, and stolen all of the gems, right? He and Ungoliant fled to the Northlands of Middle-earth where his ancient fortresses um, were established. But they quarreled as the spider had devoured all of the gems and wanted also the Silmarils, something that Melkor, now named Morgoth by Feanor, would not allow, even though their holy light burnt his hands and ceaselessly tormented him. My mans had to have them regardless. So the Silmarils were set on Morgoth's Iron Crown as the ultimate trophy, right? So Feanor obviously was furious at Morgoth and at the Valar's perceived desire to take the gems for their own purposes, which is crazy. The Valar were trying to, you know, get the gems to use them for good. Anyways, so I say perceived uh, because like I said, literally the Valar just wanted them to help keep the fucking world illuminated, but go off about your jewelry, king. Um, so then Feanor and his sons swore a terrible oath that they would not rest until the Silmarils were recovered, slaying 
anyone who stand in their way. You can probably imagine how this goes. So Feanor led the Noldor back to Middle-earth and a centenary war began against Morgoth and Valerian called the War of the Jewels. But their battles led to no end of grief for the elves and then eventually for the men of Middle-earth. So the Sindarin king Thingol knew of the Simrils from the Noldor, right? Wishing to dispose of Baron, who was trying to court his daughter Luthien, um, he tasked Baron to fetch one in trade for the hand of his daughter, Luthien, okay? Um, which is, is clearly an impossible task. So, you know, compelled by his love for Luthien, Baron reached um, Angband through great peril and loss and recovered one, only for it to be swallowed by Karkaroth, which was a werewolf that watched um, and kind of prowled the premises of, of Angband, right? So, um, yeah, my man's got his hand bit off by a fucking werewolf. The hollowed light tormented the evil Karkaroth until he was slain in what was called the hunting of the wolf. So I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of this Baron and Luthien stuff because I have been scripting a Baron and Luthien episode since season one, um, but it has to be perfect because it's my favorite story. Um, so we will go into detail about all of this in that episode, I promise. Okay, so, ha, huh, the Silmaril thus was delivered to Thingol, fulfilling his quest, much to Thingol's surprise. Baron rolls up, already fingers deep in his daughter, like, oh, what was that about an impossible task? What? Um, yeah, so I love this story so much, and I can't wait to do an episode on it so we can really go into detail. But yeah, long story short, uh, my man, Baron, who's just a human man, just a regular fucking dude, rolls up on Morgoth and retrieves one of the Silmarils from his iron crown. It's just so fucking sick. Okay, uh, anyways. Uh, fun fact though, I have a Baron and Luthien inspired tattoo. It's uh, Baron's severed hand holding a Silmaril with a romantic quote um, of his assurance he will complete the task in Luthien's honor. Um, I will obviously post that shit on the You Have My Sword Instagram for sure. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So, instead of giving it to the sons of Feanor, Thingol had the gem stored inside the dwarven pendant Naglamir, um, which was made by the dwarves of Nograd. But these dwarves, however, also coveted the jewel and thus killed Thingol. We talk about this um, a bit in my season one finale episode um, about the dwarves. So it's all kind of coming together, isn't it, right? Anyways, Doriath was ruined by the dwarves. The Naglamir was recovered by Baron and Tol Galen, and Luthien wore it until her second death, becoming the fairest vision east of the sea. It was said that their second death came early because their combined beauty was too bright for mortal lands. Yo, imagine being so hot you cannot even exist anymore despite essentially being a mortal. Okay. After Luthien's death, a lord brought the Naglamir back to Doriath, and her son, Dior, wore it. This news came to the sons of Feanor, who, stirred by their stupid fucking oath, came to Doriath and resolved to battle, during which three of the brothers were killed and Menegroth was ruined. Menegroth was a city in Doriath which was home to Thingol, his wife Melian, and the Sindarin elves during the First Age, just, just for some context there. Um, I know I do be dropping some fucking people, places, and things nonstop. It is a lot. I, I try to add context when I can. Okay, so the Naglamir was rescued by Elwing and other Sindarin survivors who fled to the havens of Syrian. Elwing, also called Elwing the White, was the third child and only daughter of Dior. So this would be Luthien's granddaughter, right? And later went on to become the wife of the well-known Arendil the Mariner, who we stand. So years passed and the Silmaril passed to the hands of Elwing's husband, Arendil, the lord of the havens of Syrian. 
his people considered the Silmaril to be a blessing for their houses and ships. But the sons of Feanor still relentlessly pursued the Silmaril, and when they learned that Elwyn escaped there, they made their demand in friendly terms while Arendelle was absent in one, on one of his voyages. Okay, let me recap that. Um, <laughs> I feel like that was a lot of words, but it made no sense. So um, Elwing had escaped back to the Havens of Syrian, right? Um, the sons of Feanor caught wind of that, so they tried um, to approach her with a deal while her husband, Arendelle, was out of town. But the people of Syrian refused to surrender it, considering it a rightful prize of Baron and Luthien, which is true. Therefore, the Feanorians resolved to make yet another assault, but again, Elwing and the Silmaril escaped. She is a slinky, sneaky bitch, and we love her. With the help of Ulmo, Elwing and the Silmaril ended up in the hands of Arendelle. It was its light that guided him through the shadowy seas and he found his way to Valinor. The Valar then set this Silmaril as a star in the sky permanently. And just for context, Ulmo was a Vala, also known as King of the Sea, Lord of the Waters, and Dweller of the Deep. He loved both elves and men alike, and it's cited that, quote, Almo loves both elves and men and never abandoned them, not even when they lay under the wrath of the Valar. We love that. The other two Silmaril remained in Morgoth's hand and were taken from him only at the end of the War of Wrath. And spoiler alert, the next episode is going to cover that. So soon afterwards, um, they were stolen by Feanor's two surviving sons, Madros and Maglor. But because of their crimes, in order to reclaim the jewels, they were unworthy of them and the jewels burned their hands in refusal of their rights of possession. So in agony, Madros threw himself and his Silmaril into a fiery pit and Maglor threw his into the sea. Thus. The Silmarils remain in all three elements of Arda, in the sky, the soil, and the water, fulfilling the prophecy made by Mandos shortly after making the gems. How fucking cool is that? So these stupid fuckers finally get these Silmarils that they were warring after for years, years upon years. They finally get them and they're not worthy of them and it nukes their hands and the Silmarils found their place where they were destined to be. So sick. So with that, that pretty much sums up the Silmarils. I hope you learned something, and if you didn't, you know where to send me hate mail by now. As always, please visit youhavemyswordpodcast.com for links to all socials, and you can find us over at Patreon under You Have My Sword if you'd like to support. It helps to make it feasible to keep doing this podcast, and it also grants you access to my Discord, where we've recently added a Horny Hobbit channel. You can infer what that means. Again, please feel free to write in with anything you think could be fun to read on the show. As you've likely learned by now, there's no rules. It's just chaos. What's even fucking happening, honestly? How does this get done every week? I don't know. Thank you, guys. And as always, you have my sword. Edgeworks Nebula.